Okay, we are recording, and just like, so let's pray. Rejoice with that work full of grace, O Virgin Theotokos, for from thee hath risen the Son of Righteousness, Christ our God, enlightening those in darkness. Rejoice thou also, righteous elder, thou receivest in thine arms the Redeemer of our souls, who also granteth unto us the resurrection. Right. So on the great feasts, as an aside, today is the Feast of the Presentation, which is the oh. 40th day after Nativity in which the Lord was presented in the temple to the righteous Zechariah, um, the priest, and, uh, and then St. Simeon, the God receiver, held him in his arms, right? And the prophetess Anna uh, also beheld him and, and prophesied to the mother of God. Um, this is also, and this isn't this isn't in the scriptures, but the tradition of Hesedus, and the Lord himself mentions it, but doesn't give the details. This was the reason that the prophet Zechariah, uh, the father of St. John the Baptist, was killed. Because the mother of God came to present the child, uh, and he placed her in the spot where the virgins were, Right. And so the the other the Pharisees and the scribes saw this happen, and saw that what he was doing because you know it's it's like the Jews all knew at that time that a, the, the prophecy of virgin shall conceive you know and bear a son his name shall be Emmanuel. So when they saw this woman being placed with the virgins who was presenting a child, they put two and two together, and you know once again uh, did not like that. So they did not like that, and so he was killed in the temple. And then that this was what spurned on Herod's um, killing of the children in Bethlehem, because there they they saw that the he was obviously informed that the child was brought and placed, and the woman was placed among the virgins. So he sent soldiers to the temple. They were the ones who killed Zechariah, um, which is what the Lord talks about when he talks to the uh, to the. Pharisees, you know, 33 some years later, where he tells them, you know, you're the ones who, who killed um, in the latest Zechariah in the temple, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's why that happened. Um, and, and yes, this, that's this feast, but uh, what was I saying? Anyways, on these days, we say that we sing the tropar. So like during the after feast of the great feasts, we sing the tropar instead of praying uh, for our meal. And other things like so instead of the our father we sing the tropar instead of oh heavenly king we say the tropar right and then uh there is even a period in which we say nothing which is 10 days in between um pasca sorry ascension and pentecost like if you're if you're studying you don't sing oh heavenly kings we don't sing oh heavenly king until we gather together on pentecost that is one of the hymns of pentecost um that's just inside uh, yeah, so are we not going to be seeing for a minute? Maybe? No, 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 no. Well, no, so that begins. Um, that begins. So during the actually, we can, yeah, we can get into this. Uh, so the Paschal season, I mean, this is probably good to go over now since it's almost Pascha. Now, Michigan's eating out of the ripped open cap, too. Um, anyways, sorry. Um, Right. Um, yeah, so so Lent and Pascha are very much a disrupting kind of liturgical thing. Um, and this is something I think we discussed with Nativity. Um, I believe I went on, on a at least a somewhat of a tangent on how to tell uh, which feasts are of greater or lesser prominence, right? Because there are people who will say that Nativity is on equal level with Pascha, which is just wrong. It's completely wrong. You look at how it's it's celebrated liturgically, and the services are how we uh, come to know how to interact with the feast, right? How to um, treat them. And so you look at Nativity. Nativity obviously has a 40-day period of fasting leading up to it, so that's bigger than any other feast except for Lent. Um, and then afterwards, there are 12 days of celebration, right? So that's it's a big deal. But Pascha is so much bigger. Like not only do you have the 40 days of Lent, because it's not 40 days and then Pascha, it's three weeks of preparation in the Triodium, and then Lent, and Lent does not end on Holy Saturday. When does Lent end? Do any of you know? Huh? Wednesday before? No, not the Wednesday before. The Friday before Holy Week. So Friday before Lazarus Saturday. So Lent is actually the fast to prepare for Holy Week. It is not the, to prepare for Pascha itself. Pascha is kind of the culmination, but it is the preparation of 
our ability to enter into the entire passion of our Lord, right? Which is Holy Week. And you even see that in the in the hymns. If you get the chance to go to the Friday, the last Friday through Sanctified at Lent, it's really wonderful. Basically, all, all the hymnography is like the time of repentance is done. It's over. We've struggled. Now is time to bear the fruit of what it is we've we've struggled to plant, right? Because during Holy Week, that's a completely different animal. You're not doing the same things you do during Lent. It's it's a very different thing. The Holy Week is the most liturgically unique uh, season of the year. It's just everything is different. Um, it up is down. Matins is served in the evening. Vespers is served in the morning. Every it, it's. The, the and that's on purpose that's not just because the schedule dictates it it's like the the church is trying to show that even time um there's a great quickening in holy week right they're just uh everything bows to to christ in his passion um and then after that obviously there's pascha and then you celebrate the paschal feast um as it's celebrated on pascha every day for a week and then after and then you have a 40-day period of feasting right? A 40-day period of the Paschal Feast where we greet each other with Christ is risen. The services are changed during that time. So there's um, all of that. And then on the last day, we celebrate once again the, the Paschal service as it's celebrated at the Midnight Liturgy. Um, and then the Ascension is the following day and, and Pentecost 10 days later. But then also everything we read every day and liturgically, like the scriptural reading, they're determined on when Pascha falls. Right. So if you'll look at any calendar for what the readings are, the readings will be X week after Pentecost. Right. Um, and, and so and that's dependent on Pascha. So you look at it's not how many weeks after Nativity. It's not how many weeks before Nativity. There's only two like weeks before Nativity in which the readings are changed. Um, but with Pascha, it, it, that determines everything. So, yeah, that's just so anyways, to get to get back to what um, you were asking. So, the yeah, the service how we pray how we greet each other how we celebrate the services all of that changes during the possible period um i i could explain it to all to you in in great detail but it's okay, it's not okay. the best way to do it is to just fumble your way through it look at what other people do, are doing and do it right you greet everyone with christ is risen and dd is risen um during the week of of bright week which is the week of pascha your prayer rule Nothing is read. Everything is sung. Um, you do the hours of Pascha, which is really, really beautiful. And it's in the prayer book. Every prayer book has it. Um, yeah, but then uh, from Ascension, so Ascension happens, and there's a 10-day period between Ascension and Pentecost where we do not say, oh, Heavenly King. So, like, you know, your normal prayers, you know, the normal beginning Trisagian prayers where it's, oh, Heavenly King, the Comforter, and then Holy God, Glory, you just start with Holy God. You just skip it. Um, and then we all sing it together. It's the, I believe it's the, uh, doxasticon for Vespers, or it's in the Litia. It's in the Litia. Uh, it's one of the Litia Apostica that we sing, uh, Stichira, that we sing, Oh Heavenly King. Um, and these cats are really gonna go at that bag. Anyways, so yeah, that, that's, that's that. So, it's basically a 10 day period. It's one, and it's one of the most difficult ones to remember. It's like, it's just 10 days. You only, you only don't say that prayer for 10 days. And so I usually remember, I'm not supposed to be saying it by day four. And then it's like, okay, well, I have six days to, to make this up, but you know, it's fine. It's fine. Um, and then during the Paschal period, actually, no. So yeah, you don't say, Oh, heavenly King, the entire Paschal period, because instead of Oh, heavenly King, you say Christ has risen three times. But then in between Ascension and Pentecost, you don't say either Christ is risen or Oh Heavenly King. Well, Christ risen from the dead by that trampling down that some promise on the tomb destroying life. So you would say that three times and then Yeah. Yep. And then the spirit of truth. No, you don't say you don't say that. You don't say Oh Heavenly King. You just replace it with Christ is risen three times, the tropar for the resurrection. Um, and then you just go straight into Holy God. And then during the 10-day period between the Ascension and Pentecost, you just go straight into Holy God. That's it. Um, yeah, and, and you'll just, and that once again is, we're informed of that by the services. If you pay attention to the services, you'll notice that's what's happening, right? So when we say the hours before liturgy, which is why it's a good idea to try and come to the liturgy while the hours are set, uh, 
you'll notice that during the possible period. They don't sing Oh Heavenly King, or they don't say Oh Heavenly King, they say Christ is risen instead. Um, yeah, so, yep. Then there's a lot of other little changes that happen. Um, it was very interesting. Do the Russian and Greek traditions usually line up on this kind of thing, or? Well, the Russian and Greek uh, traditions are, they, they use different typicons. So the Russian Tipicon is the Tipicon of the Monastery of St. Sabas in Jerusalem, which is, uh, was a set, this Tipicon was established in the 11th century and was adopted. And that was the Tipicon that was standard in the Byzantine Empire at the time of the baptism of Rus, right? So, so Russia adopted this Tipicon. Yeah, so, so um, the Russian church adopted this Tipicon and maintained it. Um, but I mean, even even then, if you read the Tipicon, you'll notice that we do things slightly differently because it, it's adopted to the culture, right? Um, and, and it develops over time. And so over time, the Greek practice deviated from the practice of St. Sabas. That doesn't mean what they were doing is evil. It just means that things changed, right? And, and so they decided to typify or codify the, those changes in a new Tipicon, which is called the Tipicon of the Great Church. Um, which is what they currently use. So one thing you'll notice if you go into a Greek church, they don't do the hours before liturgy. Um, they do matins, which is called orthros, and their orthros is very different than our orthros. Um, so they, uh, it's actually, it's, it's, they kind of went back in time in terms of how, how matins was was celebrated. Because matins, that the services are essentially the bones are the same, but they have to some degree changed in how they're celebrated. So the, the way the Greeks celebrate matins is actually predates the way St. Sabas is is celebrated. Um, so they kind of went back a little bit in their celebration of it. And they don't do the hours before liturgy unless it's a low-ranking feast. And you would only see that in a monastery. So you'd only ever see the... the, the um, yeah. Okay. I, think, I think I just assumed that St. Vlad did, did like the equivalent of Orthros before liturgy. No. But, okay. No, we do the hours, third and sixth yeah. hour which is a series of psalms and the hymns related to the day and a series of prayers tied to those hours. This makes sense. It explains why it was, it's nothing like Orthros and St. Nick's. Yeah. Right. So Orthros is an hour. Yeah. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so Orthros is an hour and the, the, and the hours, they're not actually an hour. They're like, it takes 20 minutes to go through two of them. Um, and that's the other thing. Like you look at the way the Greeks celebrate Orthros, it's an hour long, whereas our matins is like an hour and a half to two hours long. So, it's just the way it's celebrated is very different. Um, and that comes out of necessity. So you'll notice at St. Nick's, uh, they, the choir comes in at the doxology, right? So they sing, sing the great doxology, and then they go straight to the liturgy. Whereas if you'll notice at St. Vladimir's at a Saturday vigil, we sing the great doxology, and then there's still two more litanies and the dismissal and first hour. So there's still a lot of matins left. What used to be done in the Greek church um was that was kind of done and while the mat while the doxology was being sung the priest and the deacon would say silently in the altar those two um litanies and then the entire end of the matin service while it was being done to themselves and start the liturgy and over time it, it just dropped out um and that's just how it happens right that's how liturgical development happens so um yeah and there's even there is in some degree in certain areas in russia a kind of move to that there's this i was told once by a professor of liturgics he well he asked a question he said what's the difference between the russian and the greek liturgical practice it's two to three centuries <laughs> just, the russians <laughs> just end up following the greeks and what they do but you know it's it's fine um and that started really started with the um reforms of patriarch nikon um you know the the russian church was separated from the rest of the orthodox world for a couple of centuries due to the golden horde um sorry for the people online who are expecting a bible study we'll get there eventually um so yeah the, the russian church was separated uh due to the golden horde right the um the, the tartars and um and so they developed the kind of liturgical practices in isolation and the issue in the russian church liturgical difference is fine right liturgical difference is okay the problem in the Russian church was that essentially there was this sentimentality that we are the only ones who do things correctly and everyone else not only is wrong, but could quite possibly be in a heresy for doing things different than we do. 
like for example crossing with three fingers the old believers were the, the russians at the time were crossing with two like this um there were other different things that were done um so and and so basically there was this mentality in the russian church that they were the only ones who were still holding on to orthodoxy because these liturgical rites and so patriarch nikon desiring to to disavow that notion and nip it in the bud before it developed into any sort of schism or cessation of communion uh he established these reforms which unfortunately led to schism um he established the reforms but didn't uh forcefully impose it right he he basically said these are the things we're going to do in my diocese and then the russian government said that's a great idea will also kill anybody who doesn't do it and they and so the russian government um imposed it by by force with the sword and that's why this doesn't happen so it's just all of a sudden they were killing people who wanted to hold to their rights when patriarch nikon himself said you know he allowed even his own deacon for example to serve according to the old right mm -hmm. um so so it's very clear from him that that this was not this was not his mentality he did not agree with uh with the czar and how the czar did things even so much so that he he essentially towards the end of his uh life refused to serve as patriarch but also refused to step down um because he did not desire for this czar to appoint yeah. a, a patriarch who would be in of, of agreement with him which ultimately led to does anyone know what what time period this was or who was in charge Revolution? this is peter the great oh okay. this is peter the great so do you know what peter the great did in the history of the russian church he, he he the abolished the patriarchy so yeah what century? Huh? What century? 17th century. Uh 17th century yeah so 1600s and uh it's, uh yeah late 1600s early 1700s um but yeah basically he uh and he very much liked the the model of the senate which was the um european protestant model where essentially the the governing body of of the state's church was a department of the state um and was controlled directly by the state so the the governing synod in the russian church from that time until the 1918 council 1718 council um there was the synod of bishops but then at the head of the synod was a layman appointed by the czar who was who kind of had the veto power so if the bishops were doing something he didn't like just just kind of poo poo it um which is a very unnatural way of governance right and that very much led to um a lot of the elders in the russian church at the time at the time of the revolution essentially said that the lord is is bringing this wrath upon us be, because we have introduced disorder into russian society right the whole the, the establishment of the synod did a lot of really bad things in russian society creating essentially a caste system in which the priesthood was separate from the people um it was a it was a function of the government and as and being a function of the government it became um very much nepotistic and and a class instead of an office that was served from among the people um it, which led to moral degradation among the people and then ultimately the clergy and all of this stuff right so this kind of you'll see online this this concept of of quote unquote holy Rus. And um, there is a reason the revolution happened in Russia. It's because they were not holy. <laughs> so like, it was not holy. I mean, that, it very much was a was a was a purifying act for the church. It forced people to choose whether or not they were actually going to be a Christian. Very often, um, in a in a split second moment, that would end in their deaths, which is why they're martyrs, right? But it purified the Russian church. Um, those who didn't actually care to stop being Christians. Like St. Valerian Troitsky, for example, before the revolution, um, one of his very well-known quotes, he said, there, there, are, um, there are a multitude of atheists among the Christians. Mm -hmm. So essentially just, it was, it was career clerics um, who were in it for the money, who weren't, didn't really believe anything. E effectively what you have today in, in terms of like, the mainstream protestant denominations why they're all in decline it's just because these people were just getting a paycheck and it was just a job right so that and so they didn't really care about the mysteries of god and and so what when they were presented with the option of of confessing the faith or and dying or saving their lives and leaving those who were just in it for the money just said i'm out <laughs> and and so and that's i mean that's why that was it was a 
that's why the Russian church now is going through this period of spiritual revival, right? Because uh, essentially that kind of mentality was was forcefully purged by the Soviets. So whether they knew it or not, they were setting the ground for spiritual revival. And and this was and this obviously was was the Lord's will was to um, create kind of this fertile ground of of a very small group of Christians who were going to actually live the faith and then come out of the catacombs and create what we have now. Which obviously Russia is not a perfect society. We know this. They have problems. They have some often more problems than we do. But um, the, it's it's clearly evident, at least from afar, that they're they're at least struggling to do something about it in certain areas and in, in ways that we simply are not. Right? They they acknowledge that there is a God and they need to do so, and they need to struggle in repentance and it's great. And all of that is very relevant to our life <laughs> study. Um, it is sort of relevant to the Hebrews, no? Yeah, yeah, it is to some degree. Um, so yeah, so that there, there's your brief little uh, history lesson in the, in the Russian church. Um, so, anyways, Hebrews. We okay. One last question. We can ask one last question. Uh, Patriarch Nikon. Yes. Uh, he instituted reforms. What were the reforms that he instituted? Like, what were they about? They were liturgical reforms. Um, and and from the outside, they don't look very big. So like one of the things that people cross themselves with two fingers, he instituted the crossing with three fingers like the Greeks. Okay. Um, so that's what the church was doing at the time. Or that's what people used to do. That people people were doing this in Russia right. right before this kind of developed on its own. Um, the reason why he introduced the reforms was because the, there were many in the Russian church who essentially believed they were the only ones doing things right. That if you were crossing with three fingers or you were saying what they thought was too many hallelujahs, um, that you were essentially in heresy. So they were starting to believe that they were the only real Orthodox. And Patriarch Nikon, who is one of the most maligned patriarchs in the history of the Russian church by modern folk, but one of the most important and pivotal patriarchs in the russian church um you know, so you look at like there's a patriarch nikon gets a bad rap and it's mostly by scholars this is another like kind of like the first week of, of hebrews bible study once again with the scholars the scholars hate patriarch nikon but you look at who loves patriarch nikon and who loves patriarch nikon is metropolitan um anthony krupovitsky who was the first first hierarch of the russian church who while not acknowledged yet truly is one of the greatest saints of the past century and then saint john of, of shanghai and san francisco loved patriarch nikon both of them professed publicly and repeatedly that patriarch nikon was one of the most important patriarchs in the history of the russian church quite possibly in the history of the orthodox church um but yeah so i i if when it when it comes to the judging history i would be much more inclined to trust them than some St. Vladimir's person, but you know, whatever. Um, yeah, I, I would trust them much more than that, but yeah. Does that answer your question? The other thing was the Alleluias. So like at the end, during the hours, um, at the end of the, and also elsewhere, um, when reading Kathismas, in between the Kathismas, there's a kind of a break, they're called Stasis, and you say glory both now, and glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit, both on our, both now and the age of men, Alleluia, 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 glory to thee, O God. And you say that three times, right? So, what does Alleluia mean? It means glory to thee, our God. So, the old believers said, Alleluia, Alleluia, glory to thee, O God, right? Because essentially they were doing it once, twice in, in, in the Hebrew and once in Slavonic. Um, and so they believed that that extra, that extra ad was just superfluous is that how you say that word yeah, yeah. yeah. i just felt like okay anyways um so they, they thought it was unnecessary and they were very critical of the greeks for that and so these these were honestly they were very small things and so what patriarch nikon was trying to get them to do was say well you should be concerned about things of substance these liturgical differences are fine and not only are they fine but we're going to start doing them <laughs> this is basically what he said so, um this wednesday i went to uh, Vesperal, is it Vesperal or Vesperal? Vesperal. Vesperal. Liturgy at uh, St. Innocence. And it was around, it was just before the Our Father, where instead of going, say, one, two, three, four, five, no, one, two, four, three, five, it was almost their 
But I, I what do you mean? Um the prayer which Father says immediately before the Our Father, who was said immediately after the Our Father. But some little little it was some little change like that. Mm. Where the bear where the bones were all the same, but again there was a slight variation where it felt like just a little bit outside. Anyway. Well I don't know. The nominalization of Vesperal liturgies outside of their appointed time is, is a completely different completely different yeah. issue than than how often to cross oneself or how to cross oneself. And I'm not gonna touch that. <laughs> we're we are not gonna touch that because that is a mess. Um, okay, really that was a controversy. It is. <laughs> yeah. Post recording, we'll discuss it because um, <laughs> we need to get to the Bible. Yeah, okay. Sorry, we're sorry. Thirty-three minutes in. Sorry, everyone. I hope this is, best. I hope this is uh, edifying for you all. Um, see, but the thing is, see what you're experiencing right now. Everyone on the live stream is what happens when I'm trying to get my computer to work. Yeah. Is we have these discussions okay. while my computer's frozen. <laughs> But now my computer is not frozen because I have a new computer and it's working. So you all get to be exposed. You're starting the Bible study at almost the same time. That's right. But you're getting, this is bonus. You're not distracted with going back to the computer. Right. I'm not looking at the computer. We're actually able to talk about these things. So uh, the, the Hebrews Bible study will also just be um, random factuals and, and just random questions. And honestly, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them and, and you can partake in, in this hodgepodge too. Get off the dry sink. Go. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, uh, we ended at chapter four last week, right? Right. Right. And so chapter four effectively was, um, uh, it was a warning against the people of God, right? Against the Hebrews uh, to not fall into the mistakes of their forefathers, the mistakes of their predecessors, which was to harden their hearts through sin, right? And through hardening their hearts, fall away from God, fall away from God, fall away from his promise, right? And he continues this to some degree here as well. He keeps coming back to that theme once again, because th this is dealing with apostasy, right? He's dealing with people who are tempted to return uh, to the superstitions of the Jews, um, to enter into Judaism, which is not the way of the Jews. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, a very interesting kind of concept. But anyways, so we'll start with here with chapter five. St. Paul says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that is quite a large chunk of what is going on there. What is happening? that Jesus is the new high priest? Jesus is the new high priest. Yes, that is, is absolutely correct. Um, so he is comparing and contrasting the priesthood of Christ with the priesthood of Aaron, right? Um, and, and so he kind of identifies um, these kind of traits of the priesthood, right? Uh, traits of, uh, traits of the uh, Levitical priesthood. And this ultimately is a continuation of the last few verses of the last chapter. Um, once in this, this kind of chapter and verse thing is, is fairly modern, um, with the, with the invention of the printing presses when they started making these divisions, they're not always perfect, right? They just kind of, it's not like this, this chapter was the end of thought it doesn't happen, especially in, in the epistles. Um, but anyways, sorry. Oh. So yeah, St. Paul identifies the traits of the old Testament priesthood and how the priesthood of Christ is both similar because he also embodies all of those traits and unique um, in some of those ways, right? So uh, 
the first thing is that the high priests are taken from among men um, and they're ordained to it ordained in things pertaining to God that they may offer both gifts and sacrifice. These are the three aspects of the priesthood taken from among the people, um, ordained by God, given as authority by God and, and sacrificial, right? The priesthood is connected with sacrifice. So these, all of these things are, um, are necessary for the priesthood, right? So priests who are taken from among the people are like the people, right? So, so the very same things that the priests, that the people struggle with very much, very often the priests have, right? This is kind of, we see this from the very beginning of the establishment of the priesthood. Aaron was set up as priest uh, by God, you know, and, and so Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the revelation. And what is the priest doing? He's, he's taking all of the gold from the people to fashion an idol. <laughs> so they build a cow, right? So it's, it, you know, it, and it's kind of this thing. There's, there very much is a temptation, uh, not necessarily just in our days, but also this was also one of the reasons that that there was such moral degradation in um in the Russian society. There was clericalism, right, where people viewed the priests as as otherworldly or inhuman or superior in every way, and which is a problem. Um, and you see that work out sometimes um, when people refuse to let the priests do what everyone else is doing, which is silly. Um, but like you know, you look at the priests, and from the very beginning, they were the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and you look throughout the history of the church, right? And and um, how many heretics, how many condemned heretics from the ecumenical councils were not priests? Well, there's only one that I know of in Sutiki, but he was a monastic. So like all of them were either priests, bishops, or patriarchs. Like they were all clerics, right? And and so, but. The thing about that is, you know, the people are taken from the priests are taken from the people, and so they have the same struggles, the same sins as the people that they themselves are struggling with, right? So, um, so that's the first thing. And Christ, in a sense, is also like us in that He took our nature, but without sin, right? He voluntarily took our weakness. Um, none of you were at liturgy this morning, right? This was one of the things that that I talked about in the homily. Um, you know, Christ. So this is this is the feast of the meeting of the Lord, um, where Christ is brought to the temple, but we wear blue and we treat it like a feast of the mother of God. Why do we treat it like a feast of the mother of God if it's the meeting of the Lord? The Lord is going to the temple. It was also her purification, but how does a 40-year-old baby walk 40 day old baby, sorry, 40, 40 year old. That's like modern days. That's people that, yeah. yeah. How does a 40 day old baby get walk to Jerusalem and present themselves to the temple? Mom, mom brings them to the temple. The mother does it, right? So, so it's a feast of the mother of God because, you know, that Christ became what we are in all things. He took our weakness voluntarily. And so he allowed uh, the mother of God, his mother, to, to raise him up. Yes, Marty. All right, we'll let him go. Um, sorry, so he bore our weaknesses, but without himself being the cause of them or being guilty of them. Um, so that's that's the first thing, right? I have this written uh, down. So, then, so the, for here, like uh, the description of the high priest, the fact that the priest himself is compassed, and compassed around with weakness is connected here to him having to make offerings for his own sins as well as the people. Right. Whereas with Christ, it's weakness is there but not the sin right like right it, right it's a well but he but this is another thing that saint paul says elsewhere right he became sin who knew no sin okay right okay but the difference in in christ and the priest what what the mo the what makes christ's high priesthood distinct from the high priesthood of of aaron and levi is that christ's sacrifice was himself he offered himself because what what else can God offer but himself? It's the same thing, and we'll talk about this in the next chapter. But when Ab when God made an oath with Abraham, what did he swear by? Yeah. Himself, because what else could God swear by? So he swore by himself, you know, and and um, which also is is a very important thing. There are people who will say that you can't make any any oaths, right? Um, it's, this is once again a misunderstanding of the words of the Lord. You can make oaths. God made oaths, but this is what the Lord says: you have to let your yes be yes or your no be no. If you're going to make an oath, you got to do it, <laughs> and and that oath better be in accordance with with the way of God, right? So, 
we should never make an oath to, to do some sort of sin or something like that. Um, a good a good kind of analogy of that, something that's analogous, is that have any of you read the Silmarillion? No. Yeah, it's it's like the oath of the children of Feanor, right? And and just it leads to destruction. They make an oath that that they just cannot, and they they it really is an example of what letting your yes be yes and your no be no means if you make if you make a bad oath. So they make this bad oath and it leads to them doing terrible things because they're sworn by it, <clears throat> right? And so, um, yeah, so this is that, you know, that's why we should be very hesitant when doing certain, though, that kind of thing, right? Um, but even when a priest ordained, they make an oath, they swear an oath, what's the oath? To, to follow the commandments of Christ. Um, it is pretty detailed, but it's like to do all the things that are becoming of, of, a, of a Christian, um, to not cut one's hair or beard, um, that depending on a job, the priest, the bishop can offer economia, um, not to gamble, not to smoke, whatever, all these things. These things are all kind of in it, right? So yeah, it's not, it's not that oaths are bad, but <clears throat> they need to be done um, in, in accordance with, with the gospel, right? So anyways, so the priest is taken from among the people, just like Christ, uh, and thus requires the very same offerings, as you said, because he's compassed in the sins for the sins that he offers the people. Further, his status as high priest cannot be self-actualized or apparent, right? Or appointed, so he cannot declare himself a priest. Right? And, and we're dealing with this right now in our very own day and age with the, with what we call the self-sanctifiers, right? Those Ukrainian schismatics um, who declared themselves to be bishops, right? This, this is who the current ecumenical patriarch, unfortunately, is in communion with, is people who declared themselves to be bishops. And they were ordained, quote unquote, by lay people. They just like took the place of bishops and laid hands on them and put them, it was, it was deacons. A couple of deacons who declared themselves like the patriarch of, the patriarch of Ukraine and his fellow bishops, and they were ordained by laymen. And now this is just terrible. Um, you can't do that. <laughs> you, you can't you can't just take this upon yourself and there's precedence for this as well in the scriptures right in the old testament uh there was the rebellion of korah in numbers 21 right where where essentially there was a group of people led by korah uh, who was one of the people of israel who and essentially korah outlines the um baptist rhetoric in rejection of the priesthood exactly word for word um, and, and not just the Baptists, but but most Protestants in general, those who deny the priesthood, where they say that we're all a priesthood of believers. This is what Korah himself says. He says, did you not say, did God not say up on the mountain that we are a royal nation, a, a noble priesthood? So he says, we're all priests. So you can't just say Aaron's a priest. I can be a priest too. And so they start offering sacrifices. And then Moses says, this is a bad idea. You need to stop doing this. And he begs with them and pleads with them. They will not do it. And finally, he says, okay, here's the deal. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go and and you're going to offer incense and Aaron is going to offer incense. And we'll see who God accepts. Aaron offers incense while holding his staff and his staff buds. It, it produces a flower. Then Korah and his people offer incense and the ground opens up and they're swallowed into hell alive. Um, and, and so it's th this is... A, this is a historical event that clearly articulates that the priesthood is not something that we just take upon ourselves. You know, Aaron did not declare himself a priest, and Moses didn't just appoint a random person. God appointed Aaron as priest. And so, too, you know, we see with, with our contemporary priesthood, we did not declare this for ourselves. Christ appointed 12 people, the apostles. He gave them authority, and from the apostles, they shared their authority. They gave it. Right. So it is given. It is not something that we take for ourselves. So and, and this is something that that, you know, must be recognized. It's, it's the priest is not it's not of the priest's authority that anything happens. The priest is appointed by God through the hand of the bishop to do these things. But it's Christ working through the bishop. Right. So so the priest is, is partaking of the, the high priesthood of Christ and his sacrifice. Um, but it's not the priest himself. He's not. Um, special. Right. It's not. And he's not worthy of it. It's something that, that is given to him by grace. It's the grace of, of the church. Um, so that's something that, that's important to note. What else? And then for, yeah. Yeah, so it cannot be self-actualized or appointing to fix that door. That's not good. Actually, before we do this, I'm going to go fix that before we break the door. Sorry, everyone online. Gonna cinder block it open. Oh yeah, that's a good. All right. Okay. 
Is everyone tracking? We all good. Can you say once more what the sense is in which Christ, um, you know, puts on or a sin, and he say as he puts on weakness. Yeah, um, we will we will enter into a period of time which we were discussing that really talks about that, which is Lent and Holy Week. But essentially, um, you know, Christ is. Christ is God, right? What is sin? Sin ultimately is separation from God. It is it is uh, cutting a cutting off from life. Whereas life, Christ being God incarnate, he cannot be separate from himself. That's just not possible. Um, so when he took these things upon himself voluntarily, when he became sin who knew not sin, you know, sin took a body. Death took a body, as St. John Christum said, and there found God, right? So in bearing these things upon himself, he destroyed them because they could not bear being near him, right? right? And so he united our nature with himself. He, united, he freed our nature from death through partaking of death. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. It's like, uh, it, well, it, and death can only be understood in as, as a negative, right? It is itself not a substantive thing. It is like darkness. When you turn on a light, darkness doesn't fight back. It can't fight back because darkness is just the absence of light. And, and so essentially, this is what Christ is being alive when he enters into death, just turning on a light. And, and death just dissolves. It cannot bear being around life. Um, you know, and, and so he, he destroys it. He destroys it. Kind of like how evil is not itself a substantive thing. It is an absence of virtue. It's an absence of good. So to death uh, comes along with that, comes hand in hand with, with evil, where it is it is just a lack of substance. And then when the substance enters in, it's destroyed. Does that make sense? Yes. Is everyone online tracking with us so far? Been eerily silent. Lori gave a thumbs up. Yep. Good. Okay. Okay. So the high priesthood of Christ then shares these very same traits, right? As we discussed, um, his priesthood is appointed by the Father, verses five through six. He bore our weakness, verse 7, and we'll read these verses again, especially evident in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is in Luke chapter 22, um, where he asks that the cup may be passed away from him, and the angel strengthen him, and then he bears uh, our, the crucifixion, and his priesthood is sacrificial. But the third trait of Christ's priesthood distinguishes him from Aaron, however, as we discussed, in that Christ is himself a sacrifice. The, the um, Levitical priesthood offered sacrifices as a type to show them that there would come a time in which a sacrifice would be made for their sins. And they knew that these things did not save them, right? They knew, and that this is evident from the beginning, that, that they were awaiting the Messiah. They were awaiting the promised one who would redeem them of their sins. And this entire uh, law that was given was an indicator to them that first and foremost, there was nothing they could do to free themselves from sin, right? To, to make them recognize their spiritual state this is this is the whole purpose of the law is to make one recognize their spiritual state which is not good right when when you look at the law and, and this is the same with the beatitudes when christ expounds on the spiritual reality of the law and the depth of it fundamentally what that means is when you look at it and when you look at yourself honestly it's like oh i'm i'm in real i'm in a bad spot right it's I'm, I'm there's no way i can justify myself and that's the point of the law the point of the law is not to save but to expose the problem to expose the the sin that is there in order to produce spiritual poverty right this is what saying this is what the lord says blessed are the poor in spirit for there is the kingdom of heaven so the goal of the law was to produce in israel a desire to be saved a desire to be redeemed and a recognition that apart from God, they could do nothing. They cannot save themselves from their state, right? So they they need Christ. So the law is necessary in the sense that it exposes what we are for who we are and brings us into recognition that we need God. And then through that, the lawgiver himself frees us from that sin, which is Christ, right? He bore, he, he subjected himself to the law in his life. He fulfilled the law in its entirety in that he showed us the path to perfection showed us the path to freedom and then through participating in that in sin through becoming sin who knew not sin he then freed us from the burden of the law where the law condemns christ frees that makes sense where are we at this here 
Right, and so this is what it means to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Do So we've said that three times now. Twice when we read it, once when I just said it. Do you know who Melchizedek is? No. I don't know that there's Melchizedek, but I couldn't think in what century. Okay. All right, so we're going a little ahead here because this is chapter 7 where where St. Paul explains who Melchizedek is. We're not going to go through chapter 7 until next week. So uh, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which is a city called Peace, right? That Salem means peace. Um, and so in, in Genesis chapter 14, so during Abraham's life, uh, while he was establishing um, his own reign and he was uh, being established by God as, as kind of the seed through which the Messiah would come, um, he entered into a battle with various other kings, kings in the in the region, and through that gained himself land, right? The land that God had promised him. Um, and when he conquered against the other kings, then this king named Melchizedek came to him from Salem, which mean, which means peace. So the king of peace came to him, and he was also the high priest of the living God, is what he's how he's described. He has no genealogy. So this is something very important in Genesis. In Genesis, you know where people come from, right? Everyone, you know who their father is and you know who their children is. So here comes this character who has no father, who is the king of peace and the high priest of God and offers up to Abraham that which he had offered to God, which is what? Bread and wine. He offers him bread and wine that were consecrated to God. And then what does Abraham do? He partakes of the bread and wine and then tithes to Melchizedek. And then Melchizedek vanishes. He, that, that's all you see of him. And, and just is this is this encounter, right? And so, but that is a very powerful thing. And, and once again, I mean, he had no known father. He had no known um, descendants, nothing. And, and so the fathers, and, and here St. Paul, once again, uh, expounds on this. This is Christ. Christ appears to him and blesses him and offers him a type of the Christian mysteries, right? And, and, and Abraham partakes of this and then uh, tithes to him, gives to him that which he has, offers to, to uh, Melchizedek, who is a type of Christ, that which he has, right? And so this is Christ appearing to him, the pre-incarnate word, um, if you will. And, and this is something that St. Paul will talk about. He'll explicitly talk about that in chapter 7. But since we're not reading chapter 7 today, we'll just do that because we, we're going to hear about Melchizedek a lot. Essentially, chapters 5 through around 10 are what the priesthood of Melchizedek is and why Christ embodies that priesthood. So it's good to establish that now. Okay, so does anyone have any questions on the on the online stream or here? Any other questions? comments or concerns. So we're going to find out what the order of Melchizedek was? Is that what you're saying? We will. It's in chapter 7. He says exactly, essentially what I said. Well, you know, we'll just read read what he says. No, you know, we're going to go back to Genesis. We're going to go, we're going to go to the original. <laughs> we'll just make this easy for everyone. And read the Genesis story so that we don't get confused here. Okay, so Genesis, Genesis 14. Uh, We'll start with verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of, oh goodness, Kedorlaomer. The, the issue with the King James is that it separates it to try and make it easier to pronounce and makes it very difficult. Very long name. And of the kings that were with him in the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was a priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Abraham gave him tithes of all. Right. So, so this person appears out of nowhere after this this battle, and um, blesses him, gives him bread and wine, and then he tithes him. So this and this priesthood is unique in the sense that this, yeah. 
it, it, and St. Paul will talk about how it is unique. So we'll just let St. Paul do it and let, let me not try to explain it anymore. Um, so that is the only instance that we hear of Melchizedek, and this entire book is about Melchizedek, which is very interesting. Um, but yeah, so anyways, let's let's keep reading on. Where are we? Verse 11. We'll go back a little bit. So verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten. So Christ, as we said, um, he was appointed priest by the Father, right? He, he did not take this upon himself, but it was the goodwill of the Father that all men should be saved, and Christ uh, embodied that, that salvific work. As he saith, also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and he was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Right. This is this is a, a call back to the Garden of Gethsemane, right, where Christ prayed uh, that if it be the will of the Father, he take that cup away from him, that cup of of uh, condemnation of becoming sin who knew not sin. Um, and the Lord heard his prayer and, and in answering his prayer, strengthened him through sending of an angel. Um, and, and then he, ended, he through obedience to the will of the Father, entered onto the cross and, and worked salvation out for us, right? And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Once again, it says Melchizedek twice. And he's going to say a lot more here. Um, okay, so keep reading on. Of whom we have many uttering things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as of need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So here he he establishes who Christ is, right? And how he is of a priesthood that is um, similar in, in every respect to the Levitical priesthood, but different in that he is of the order of Melchizedek. Um, and then instantly goes into a rebuke of, of the Jews, right? Because he's writing this to the Hebrews. Um, and, you know, he essentially what he's telling them is you should know all of this. <laughs> it's like, you should know this. You, sh you like, th this is what God was preparing the people for. He is cultivating this understanding, this knowledge of who the Messiah is throughout the history of, of the people of God, right? This, this is the history of God's interaction with, the people at first it was simply adam and eve and god and they had intimate knowledge of god but as the people fell away through sin then the greater masses gained a lack of understanding of god right and then the lord focused on select people right so he continued to illumine his chosen people whereas everyone else fell away so he's he's preparing the israelites right and the problem in the problem that that occurs is that the israelites then fall into pride where instead of seeing themselves as what they should be which is a prophet to the world to proclaim the good news of god to the gentiles they then see themselves as superior to the gentiles and as um as what's the word that i'm thinking of um they do not see the gentiles as as being worthy of their time because the, the gentiles were not chosen by god they were Right, and so they be, they grow inward. They they um, become insular. They uh, cease to. They fail to fulfill their duty as Israel, which is to be the light of the world. Right, to proclaim the good news to all of the world, and in so doing, they enter into this essentially heresy. Right, uh, which is identified now saint paul kind of talks about it he talks about it throughout his epistles but saint ignatius of antioch actually identifies it very well um where he calls it simply judaism judaism he identifies as a heresy right and what is judaism it's not just being a jew or of the tribe of it of of israel the chosen people of god but it's the rejection of israel's calling right to be a light to the world and and so it, it is judaism that led to the killing of the prophets the rejection of god's revelation to man 
the God's revelation being that Israel will be the light of the world, that the Messiah will be for all nations. Uh, those who became insular, those who rejected the will of God, who were hardened to God, then rejected God's grace in that. And I brought, I grabbed this book, so we'll read this quote. I wrote it down here as well, but um, we'll read it here. And I'm, I showed this book um, at the, sorry, I showed this book at the Monday evening Curious Vlad. Curious Vlad. And this is a book called The Apostolic Fathers. Um, have you seen this book? Any of you? Uh, I, I think so, yeah. You would like this because it's Greek and English, right. um, which is very good. But yeah, the Greek is very useful here. Um, but St. But Saint Ignatius, we celebrated him last Sunday. Um, he was one of the first bishops of Antioch. He was the child who sat in Christ's lap. Um, when Christ uh, said, if, if you wish to be, if you wish to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must be like innocent like these babes, um, and then blessed him. And then he was discipled by St. John the Theologian. Um, so very, very prominent early church uh, writer, right? So he, when he only wrote at the very end of his life as he's being marched to his death, he wrote a series of instructional letters. And you get a really good idea of how the church was structured at that time, which should come as no surprise, it's exactly how it's structured today. <laughs> it has not changed. Um, and he even makes explicit, like he he identifies the threefold hierarchy of the church, how it interacts, recognizes that if you are not a part of a Christian community that has that valid threefold hierarchy, you're not actually in a, a church. You're not a part of the church, is, is what he says. Um, we need to do everything with in accordance with the, with the church. But he also deals with Judaizers, right, which, which was a very prominent heresy at the time. And, and this is what he says about it. He says, do not be deceived by strange doctrines or antiquated myths since they are worthless. For if we continue to live in accordance with Judaism, we admit that we have not received grace. For the most godly prophets lived in accordance with Christ Jesus. This is why they were persecuted, being inspired as they were by his grace in order that those who are disobedient might be fully convinced that there is one God who revealed himself through Jesus Christ, his son, who is his word that came forth from silence, who in every respect pleased the one who sent him, right? And this harkens back to the first chapter of, of Hebrews, right? Where St. Paul begins the book of Hebrews by saying there is no disunity between Christ and the prophets, but rather all of the prophets spoke concerning Christ. He is the culmination and the fulfillment of the prophets, whereas Judaism is a rejection of the prophets, right? So, so the Jews um, who killed Christ, right? It, it's not that they believed Christ to be a heretic. They knew exactly what Christ was saying about himself, and they knew that this is what the prophets said. They just rejected him because they didn't want him to be the one. <laughs> but they knew that Christ... They knew at least to some degree that Christ would be divine, that he would be a God-man. They, they may not have understood quite how that worked, but the, the Jews were not monotheistic as they are today, right? They, they didn't believe that God was simply one person. They recognized that there was at least the Son and the Father, but many also recognized a Trinitarian nature. They simply couldn't, uh, a Trinitarian facet of, the, of, of God, but they simply couldn't articulate it, right? Because it wasn't revealed to them. But they knew, I mean, they have the same scriptures we do, right? When Abraham was visited by the Lord, how did the Lord appear unto him? As three, as three angels. Um, so as three angels, right? And he, he And he referred to them as what? Lord. He spoke to them as one person. So, right? And then even in the very beginning, in the very beginning of Genesis, it's Trinitarian in how the, how creation is established, right? Um, so God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit hovered above the water. So God spoke, right? So the Father thought, the Son spoke, and the Spirit enlivened. Right? So it's a Trinitarian act. So from the very beginning, and throughout all of the Old Testament, you see this this kind of shadow of the Trinity. And this is why we celebrate the feast. We call the Feast of Theophany Theophany because it means God revealed, right? God has manifest. The Trinity is revealed in in no uncertain terms. But that wasn't a surprise. It's not like that came out of nowhere. It's not like this is just this completely new thing, um, right? So when Christ made these claims, they, the, the Jews weren't saying, uh, you're speaking out of nowhere. They, you know, they, when he called them, when he, yeah, so they, they knew what the Messiah was, but they rejected him as the Messiah. And so St. Ignatius is essentially articulating what St. Paul was saying. And saying Judaism is an ideology, is a rejection of the revelation of God. 
in favor of this insular notion uh, that that the Jews are not necessarily just the chosen people of God, but the sole inheritors of divine mercy on earth, right? So, and, and so this rejection of the Messiah as a person for all the nations. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can ask the annoying question. Yeah. You know what the, what the Greek word for Judaism there? I got to also look afterwards, but... Uh, I need to look into this more, but okay. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll this right. is something that I want to research. Well, because I just want to, because today, I mean, we're a lot more comfortable with abstract nouns like isms and so on than right. ancient authors. Where it might be like few dice moss or something like that, but Judaizing, I would be enterprised if it's something like that. But sorry. Da, 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 da. Your dice, man. Okay, so it is, it is, yeah, it is, it is the, the abstract. Yes, yeah, the abstract. Okay, I think it's They don't like abstract words? Yeah, they do use them. They just use them way less often than we oh, do. Okay. Like, yeah. usually names, like, you know, you wouldn't say, you know, America went to war with Canada. You'd say, you know, America went to war with Canada. You know, you wouldn't say, you know, America went to war with Canada. You would say, the Americans went to war with the Canadians. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, you could say it. It's not an universal thing. And so it's not like impossible that he was like, yeah, we view Daddy Smalls there. Right. Um, well, and, and I, that really hurt. I, when I read that, I was like, I, what I need to do is go back and look at and look at the Septuagint. I don't think that word is used in reference to the Jews at all. I would be surprised if it isn't Septuagint. Yeah, yeah I don't think it is because they're spoken of as a people, but yeah. that is spoken of as as a way of thinking. Right. So it's like these are two very different things. And and well, in St. Hilarion Troitsky, I was I was thinking about this as well in his book, Christianity or the Church, which, if none of you have read, is foundational reading, foundational Christian ecclesiology, along with St. Ignatius, um, establishing what the church is. But um, he essentially, uh, he identifies and, and establishes uh, this kind of new concept. It's not really a new concept, but he, he gives a word to it. It's, it's, he calls it Christianityism. Or Christianism, right. which is just the the turning of Christianity into an ideology and rejecting the living revelation of God's presence on earth, right? Of of and and so ultimately it makes you people of the book, right? So um, it, yeah, it, when when you, when Christianity ceases to be a living experience of God and becomes a a um a classroom, if you will, or just a study of of um a study of text and the accumulation of data and the formulation of, of thoughts based on that data, then it ceases to be a living thing and becomes just like any other ideology, right? And, and that to me very much what seems similar in kind of the concept that St. Ignatius is pointing out here where, where they're rejecting God's activity um, in favor of this kind of, this insular way of life, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in that way, it's a heresy, right? It's a rejection of God's grace. It's a rejection of God's, uh, the economy of salvation in favor of, um, well, I mean, I guess a good way to look at it is in the Old Testament, right? Um, God, when when they created the gold, golden calf, what, what did God do? No, he did not destroy it. What happened? Well, Moses comes down first. Moses comes down. He gets very upset. Um, he smashes the tablets. God had God had um, fashioned the tablets himself. And then the second time Moses comes down, he fashioned the tablets himself. So whereas God himself inscribed the law into tablets, then Moses had to do it. So um, they were further mediated between, between the people and God with Moses. Um, but then, so yeah. They, they make them melt down the calf, but what happens after that? How does God respond to this? He sends serpents, right? He sends serpents into the camp, and the serpents begin biting the people, and they're poisoned, and they're dying. And he tells Moses to do what? Make to make the bronze serpent on the rod, right? And everyone who looks on the serpent on the rod will then be healed which is a type of the crucifixion, right? Um, to gaze on Christ is to be healed of our infirmities, 
right? To gaze on the one who saves us. And so he he tells him to fashion this image for them to look at so that through the image they may be healed. Then what do the Jews do? So they fashion the freaking After that, they begin to idolize the servant. <laughs> they, 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 they make an idol out of the serpent. And I think this is a good kind of image of what of what Judaism is instead of the way of the Jews, right? Which is ultimately leads to Christ. Um, it is taking the things that God has given and worshiping them over the creator, right? The Pharisees worshiped the law instead of the lawgiver. They worship they because the law was for them a means of power and prestige. So they saw it and they, they recognized what Christ was, which was the fulfillment of the law. And they didn't want that because the fulfillment of the law necessitated the end of their reign. It was over. It was done. And they and, and so they said, well, maybe if we just kill him, <laughs> we'll, we'll have it a little longer. And and all of Jerusalem was destroyed, right? 40 years later by the Romans. Um, so, so yeah, th this kind of, that's how Judaism plays out on the ground. It's a worship of things that, that God has given instead of God himself. That makes sense. And so St. Paul talks about that throughout um throughout the scriptures right and, and he talks about that a lot in terms of circumcision this is where the judaizers really came out in christianity is they followed paul around after he baptized the gentiles and then they said okay well now you also have to be circumcised because you have to do the things of the law and obviously that was condemned right in, in acts 15 in the council of jerusalem they, they rejected that that notion and so the gentiles don't have to do this because they recognize that christ's priesthood is different than the priesthood of Levi, where Levi was just a type, Christ is the real, he is that which the type points to. So that which points to the real thing then is fulfilled and is done away with. So so the Gentiles are no longer, like we can eat, we can eat bacon. That's ba like, <laughs> we can eat pork. We don't follow those kind of, those, those laws that set us apart because what sets us apart from the world is in our hearts, right? And people know whether you know it or not, if you struggle to live a Christian life, they know. They may not be able to articulate it, but, you know, it's, it's we don't, and, and at the time, they needed those external things. That's why God gave it to them. They needed those external things to set them apart from other people. But now we don't need that. And people recognize that there's something different about us. Usually they think we're just a little weird. And then once they start to pry into it, then they realize, oh, it's a lot worse than we thought. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, this, is, this is getting serious, right? It's like, it's that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, right. So so yeah, that's. But I do I do want to look into that because I I kind of discovered that I was texting Father Gregory at like one a.m. earlier this week. I like would not believe. <laughs> it was surprising, yeah, to hear it. It was yeah. I was I was like I was like, have you ever seen this anywhere else? And he was like. You know, I don't think I have, and, and at least in that in those early writings. Yeah. And then we and then both of us were just like. And so I, well, this is the, this is the issue. Once again, I, I don't think the, the people here got this because eSword, I would be able to just search the Greek ah. in the Septuagint and I'd be able to find it if it was there. And so I can't do that with this computer, but I still have my old computer. I'll just have to wait for an hour to be able to search that term um, or if I'm ever in my lab at work, but you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, one of the nice things about eSword, and, yeah, and one of the nice thing, one of one of the redemptive aspects of technology is you're able to do something like that. Um, so Andrew, okay, well, you we can do with the so yeah, <laughs> this, but I think you need a universe. Well, I, I don't actually know about a good free tool. Oh, it's not free. Well, eSword, eSword is free. Yeah. Like there's generally Greek searching agencies, there's a good tool, but you need a university. Oh. After there's another really yeah. good. Um, I can't remember the name of of the app, but it's it's paid. And it's effectively a, a paid for eSword. And it has a really powerful search tool for the Greek and Hebrew. Um, I just don't have it. I can't remember the name of it. I'd have to look it up. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. I just use eSword, but now I can't. So maybe I have to buy the one. I don't know. Um, if it's on Linux, who knows? <laughs> who knows if it's available on Linux? And realizing how, like, I don't know. OK, this is battery low. Uh... We're going to take a quick pause here. Take a quick pause so I can get my charger. I know where it is. Look at that. Sorry, everyone. Here, in there.
All right, you online people have been very quiet. Do you have any questions or comments or concerns? Uh, I have an unrelated question to unrelated to our Bible study. We we can digress. We've been digressing a lot. Go for it. Okay. Well, F, that serpent's part. I've never heard the serpent's part of the the Moses story. By the way. Really? Yeah. I was joking with Stephen. I was joking that uh, the movie ended before that part came up, so I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> um, yes, that's an Exodus. So yeah, the the Prince of Egypt, which is a phenomenal movie. Oh, it, it is such a good movie. Um, yeah. Anyways, yeah, it only covers like the very beginning of the Book of Exodus. There's so much more. Um, yeah, it, it, it is it the old Charleston Messing one has the uh, the one it throws down? Uh, Sorry, I'll be right back. My kids are wanting to say it has the idol, right? <laughs> actually, I can't see the idol. Marty, come here. But not the circle. I don't think the idol. No, no. I don't think the idol. Prince of Egypt ends with the water down right about the losing. Okay. Yeah, so Prince of Egypt ends with the golden calf, right? And But not his reaction to the golden calf. Just before. Yeah, so. Well, so okay, we now have our 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 um, assistant professor. You smoke. Okay. Um, oh, that was recorded. So <laughs> yeah. So so I would I would highly re well, and also a part of one of the Lenten readings is the Book of Exodus. Um, at least towards the end. So so in in Lent on the weekdays of Lent. Um, once again, the, the services inform us in the degree of, of, for example, fasting. We don't even read the gospel in the weekdays of Lent, um, which is very interesting. We read Proverbs, Genesis, and Isaiah. And then towards the end of Lent, we read um, I believe portions of Ezekiel and Exodus once we finish Genesis. Um, so, yeah, I, I would highly recommend at some point you read the book of Exodus. It's just, well, and the Pentateuch in general, the Pentateuch is fascinating. There's so much stuff that's just, yeah, if, you, if you've only watched the movies or things which are good, right, there's so much more. There's really so much more. A lot of the time. It is weird. Yeah. It's hard to understand. Um, you dropped your binky. Why'd you do that? You've seen kind of the about Tosh I don't think, no, no. Well, the point is that it pales in comparison to It's like we've passed the book. Right, yeah, because a lot of it's just too. You, you can't fit it. It has to be a movie series. Oh wow, I feel really bad. Right. Tim, would... <laughs> sorry, Tim. <laughs> I didn't check the chat. <laughs> Every time he said, "I can actually hear everyone." Sorry, can't talk. Oh, the wow. moment we started the live stream, and wow. I was heckling him for at least ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Tim. Um, <laughs> uh, Prince of Egypt. <clears throat> Is it a con? Have you never seen the Prince of what? Egypt, Lori? <laughs> what? Never heard of it? Oh, Lori, you need to fix that. No, it is not a, a comedy. It what is mean, so. From the Egyptian perspective, maybe it's a point. The magicians are kind of funny, but um, but the, it. Yeah, they're they're yeah they're bad. No, no, the prince. The, okay, so the prince of Egypt and um and what is it, Joseph? Uh, not that one. No. <laughs> not that one. It's Joseph, but, um, King of Dreams. King of Dreams. Yeah, Joseph, yeah. King of Dreams, and that one, but... it is excellent. So that one and um the prince of Egypt are both like they are they are the most biblically accurate um pieces of cinema i've ever seen like they handle the source material so well and so reverently and it's just it is so good um it, it's it's ba like yeah those are those are some of the only things i've watched where it's like yeah it's like reading it it's it's almost like reading it right and it's great music yeah, we, um, and the animation is just oh, we, we annoy our uh, children. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, somehow, yeah, 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 Lori, it is it is somehow a kids movie. It, it, somehow um, that is very faithful to, to 
for the Old Testament and is really good and has good musical numbers. Right. Somehow. It doesn't really make any sense. But it could be. And, and it handles, well, I mean, it handles some, especially Prince of Egypt. It, it's a kid's movie, but it also does not shy away from, yes. you know, yeah, the, the slaughtering of the children. It's like, oh, it's it's there. <laughs> it's like, it's it's good. Um, it's good. Actually, hmm. We watched that with the kid. Well, we're doing a youth group this Sunday, and I was thinking about what to do. Adults, may, uh, it's, it's, it's a while. Yeah, it's it. it's a very good movie. I highly recommend it. Um, but it is a kids movie. There's yeah, it, there's, but it, it it's really really good. Okay, so that digression. Uh, but anyways, I, the point is, is yeah, read Exodus, read Genesis, and you'll go, wow, I didn't know most of this stuff was in here. Um, but it is, and so there's some wild stuff that happens. It, it's a wild ride. Same with numbers. People like to really um, dig on numbers because it's like a census of the people. But throughout numbers, there are these historical interludes that are just so theologically rich, like the rebellion of Korah in, in Numbers 21. It's like, um, here's a census of all of the people. Then all of a sudden, oh, Korah rebelled. And here's a defense of the priesthood, right? So it, things like that. And then Deuteronomy, of course, is like just this wonderful summation of everything that happened in the first four books but you can't read that and then without you need to read all but yeah it, it's all good it's, it's moses parting words but excellent excellent moses did write all of them he foresaw his death he knew so he wrote about his own death um don't listen to modern people who are silly and, and just say well he couldn't have possibly known about his death many of the same thing about the guys it's, it's fine um a good also a good um accompaniment to that would be the life of moses by saint gregory of nisa very very excellent and short work um just phenomenal phenomenal piece of it he takes a lot of the difficult to understand things and explains them now he does explain them in a very theologically advanced way um but it, it's a good book it's a very good book especially he, he almost all of the book is about moses being up on the mountain and what the darkness of God means, where he is, God is light, but the light is so light and it's dark. It's just, he cut, it's, it's very, it's a lot. It's, it's beautiful. Read the life of Moses, highly recommend it, but first read the Pentateuch, especially Exodus. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's great, right? Do you like, do you like Exodus? It's gonna suck your thumb. Okay, let's read up. I so, do have a question attached to that comment. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, about uh the feast today my kids were we were talking about it today they were asking me questions one of the questions was how old was simeon um when he met jesus christ in the temple simeon was roughly 360. so Thank simeon you. was one of the 70 uh, scribes who were chosen by the Alexandrian rulers uh, to translate the Hebrew text, Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, which we know as the Septuagint. And that happened in the third century BC, right? So before Christ, three centuries before Christ, um, he was one of the scholars and he was translating Isaiah. Um, and in Isaiah uh, chapter seven, verse 14, it says, and, and behold, a, a sign shall come, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and his name shall be Emmanuel. Right. And, and so he was translating this and and um, and he said, well, in, in Greek, there are two. The, the word that is in the Hebrew can be translated in two different ways. It can either be translated into virgin or young woman. And he found it hard to believe that a virgin would conceive because that's never happened before. He said, well, virgins can't conceive. And so he was tempted to translate it to a young woman shall conceive. Right. And, and to remove. Um, not necessarily to deny that she was a virgin, but to introduce the possibility of doubt, right? And, and so the archangel Gabriel appeared to him, grabbed his hand before he was about to write it, and told him, no, you need to write a virgin shall conceive, and behold, you shall not die until you see this, right? And, and so he was in the temple for three centuries waiting for this thing to happen, faithfully waiting and so and when you know that, like the, the prayer is far more poignant. He's holding the, the Christ in his arms and he's saying, just let me go. <laughs> now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. You know, the word is that what, what Gabriel gave to him. You will not die until you see this thing. So he's like, you told me I would not die. Now let me go. 
right? And and this also, I mean, St. Gregory Palamas talks about this. He says that that this prayer of, of the elder Simeon is also a, it, it is the disposition of those in, in those Israelites faithful to Christ, which was allow the, the law to pass and be fulfilled in Christ and allow this new life, this new resurrection, this resurrected life to happen, right? To live in the reality of the resurrection. Um, and to live according to the, the to the priests of Melchizedek, right? So this this is the disposition of those Jews who are faithful to Christ, um, and so he's he's seen as a type, right, for all of the the Jews who uh, who embrace the Messiah, if you will. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, Jackie? Yes, thank you. Very good. Okay, it is. Wow, was that eight thirty? Okay, we'll blast through chapter six. Uh, so, the, so the first three verses continue on uh, from where we were reading in, in the last chapter. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So essentially what he's saying is all of these we've already established. All of these we've already discussed um, at this point. You either accept it or you don't. And if you accept it, let's move on. Let's discuss those things that are, that are um, that are deeper, right? And once again, if God permits, so it's it's through the Lord that we learn these things. It's through the Lord uh, that we accept these things. It's ultimately through Him that all of this happens. So He's saying, you know, we're not going to keep rehashing this. We're not going to keep going back to this point. You either accept it at this point or you don't. You should know better, um, embrace it, or don't embrace it. That that's the choice that you have, which is a very good maxim, right? There there will be people who will want to simply argue with you all of their lives about the faith. And and you need to recognize that there is a point in time in which you you just don't argue with them anymore. You know, and, and this is kind of the I believe it's somewhere in St. Paul's epistles, but he says something along the lines of, of you give people three chances, you explain the faith three times, and if they continue to argue the same point, then you walk away. You just shake the dust off your feet and you say, We're done here. There's no point. There's there's no point because ultimately what you're doing is you're just you're casting your pearls before swine. You're casting the good things of salvation towards somebody who's proven through their actions they're not going to hear. That doesn't mean you just you you say well you know I guess you're just going to go to hell. But you, you just say that until the disposition changes, there's no point in having this discussion, right? So if somebody is, and and that person can change and that might even be salvific for them if they see that you're not going to talk about it, then they'll start to take what you said to heart. They'll start to think about it. They'll start to ruminate. But some people just want to argue. They just want to. They just want to dissent for the sake of dissension. And, and and we shouldn't give them that opportunity. That's not healthy for them. It's not healthy for us. Right? Oh, oh you are reaction. pooping. Do you see that face? Yeah, yeah, I saw that <laughs> she, yeah. She's flexing. It was. She's a. Uh, yeah. Wow. I'm scared. All right. I got, I got a bomb on my lap. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for anyways, reading on. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But he, but he, but that which which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded of better things for you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. What is that all about? Well, they basically quoted, what was it? Where's the prayer? Huh? Partakers in the, where was it? And have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. It's from the liturgy. I can't pinpoint where the liturgy is from. But as soon as I read it, it was. Yeah, well, we pray to be to receive us today as a communicant, right? For we must speak of the mystery of the enemies, this prayer of St. John Chrysostom, who is it for communion. Um, but he's he's warning them, right? So, he, so he's basically said, we've talked about the foundations of the faith, these things that are foundational, so let's move on. And then he warns them once again against apostasy. He says, but if you allow yourself, if, if if having partaken of these things, having attained great spiritual heights, right, moved on from milk to meat. So he's warning them of basically saying, if you enter into the, the deep mysteries of God and then choose to fall away, you know, the high, the, the closer you grow to God, and if you fall away, the greater the fall, 
And so he's warning them. You know, it's it's just um, there there is a point in which there will be no return if, if you reject Christ because you will have hardened your heart to such a degree that you simply will not repent. Well, it is impossible here, right? Like that somebody could could um, come to Christ and then turn away and then come back. But is that is that the right way to take it? Like I feel like that must happen, right? That people. Well, right, but it, it what's important um, what's important to establish here is verse four, right? He says, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So ultimately those who were illumined and sanctified and who achieved heights, right? right heights of, of heavenly things who became spirit. Cause you know, and, and this is not when we start in the Christian life, when we begin I drink your water. I see that. Sorry, I was thirsty. Um, yeah, so when when we start in the Christian life, we're like children, right? This is and when and this is you'll hear in the baptismal service when it's read. Once someone is baptized, they're referred to as a baby, referred to as a baby, and that's because in the spiritual life you're starting from the beginning, right? You are an infant, um, and and you are in a position where you need milk, you need simple things, you need to be nourished by the church through Holy Communion. But it's through living the life of the church that you grow into maturity, right? There is a ne necessary maturity. Everyone goes through the same stages of development, right? And people think it's unique to them, this period of spiritual dryness a few years into their life of the church, this period of, of uh, inability to pray like they once might have been able to. These are all just the training wheels coming off and us having to walk on our own, right? Because God gives us this kind of, he guides us, he walks us through, but eventually he desires for us to, grow in christ to acquire the mind of christ in order to do that it's just like with kids right if we held our children in, in, and helped them walk all of their lives they'd never know how to do it themselves eventually you have to let go and you have to let the child walk and that may involve them falling and stumbling but if they keep getting up then eventually they won't fall and stumble Right. And, and I think that's the important thing to note here is that he's not talking about those children that are falling and stumbling. He's talking about those who have already known to walk most of their lives. And, and if you choose to fall away, right, if you choose that you're never going to walk again, how great is that fall? Right. Um, this is like Judas, right, who partook of the of the mysteries of Christ, who, who lived with Christ for three years um, and then betrayed the, the master and could not bear it to the point where he killed himself right so so that he he shut himself out cast himself out from the kingdom and and uh killed himself but and then conversely you have the apostle peter right who denied christ three times but repented in such a way that he was restored by christ right it, it says that judas repented meaning he regretted his decision but he, how he handled his repentance was by killing himself by taking himself out whereas peter repented but then the moment he saw christ again fled to him he wants a nest okay hi baby so you know it, it what that doesn't mean is that um falling and stumbling means that we're cast out forever or there's no hope for us but it what it does mean is to what degree we are close to christ the fall will be greater than than if we are not right so peter was very much an infant in his faith he was um, he was zealous, but without knowledge, right? So he would say things like, I'll never deny you. Um, I believe you're the Christ. But then the moment Christ would begin to, to speak about the mysteries of, of the age to come, Peter would tell him, stop, <laughs> like, stop talking. Like I, like Christ would then, like, you know, th this is in, in, I can't remember which gospel it is, uh, but Christ says, who do the people say, it? or who do the people say I am? And they're like, oh, you're, you're, some say you're a great prophet. Some say you're John the Baptist raised from the dead, whatever. And, and the Lord says, but who do you say I am? And Peter is the first among any of them and says, you are the Christ. And he said, and, and so, you know, the Lord then says, you know, you, you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church, which is the rock of his confession. And then immediately after that tells them, okay, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be given over to the Jews and I'm going to be crucified. And then Peter says, stop talking. He's like, this is wrong. And then the Lord looks at him and calls him Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because his confession changed. He made a, a confession of faith that was true, but he was ignorant of the greater truths of the Christian faith, right? But the more Peter grew in knowledge, 
the the less that happened. And you see what at the you know at Pentecost these kind of falls simply were not present. He had some, he had some degree of struggle with the embrace of the Gentiles and figuring out how that worked, but all the apostles did, and they worked it out of the Council of Jerusalem. Um, but there was never a point in which he denied Christ, right? So the the closer he grew in the mysteries of God, the more strengthened he was. Whereas with Judas, he could not bear it and he killed himself. So that's kind of that's what Paul is kind of hearkening to here. Um, and and he gets onto that. We'll read. We'll continue reading because he does discuss this, right? Um, sorry. Verse nine, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Thank you for getting slobber on my Bible baby. Uh, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So essentially what he's telling them is, um, you know, you may doubt these things, you may have difficulty understanding these things, but because you are in a position, uh, and, and he's talking to Christians, right? He's talking to Christians of, of the Hebrews, but he's recognizing that due to their spiritual immaturity and their inability to understand these greater Christian mysteries, while they may doubt and while they may reject at times, he's he's saying that, you know, the Lord will not forget your good works and you shouldn't either. You have a chance to turn away from this. You have, If you have rejected the things of God out of ignorance, then you can, knowing your ignorance, come back to Christ, right? So he's saying that there is hope for them. But if they were in a position, and that's why he's warning them, right? If, if they're going to move on and they're going to talk about greater things, they need to know the weight of that. Does that make sense? Is everyone online tracking? Thumbs up. Excellent. So that was what verse 12. Verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, like we said earlier, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the, Im the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul, which both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Once again, Melchizedek. Thoughts on that? What's the veil? That uh, that curtain that covered the um, Holy of Holies, okay. which was ripped when Christ was crucified, right? So they're entering right, right, into right. the great mysteries of which only the high priest was permitted. But it's the, it's the hope which is entering in here, right? Right. Okay. Well, through hope we enter, right? Yeah, the hope enters because it's that, that which we have as an anchor for our soul, right, which okay. is Christ. We place our hope in Christ, and through placing our hope in Christ, he guides us into life, into all truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does anybody not want to? I'll have some. If we need leftovers, they can hear us. We do. There's a lot. What? Why are you fussing? If there's possible leftover. Sorry, I need to find this kid's binky. She's getting mad at me. It fell into my backpack. Uh -huh. I take this to work next day or be at church and open my backpack and be like, oh, interesting. That's not, that's happened more than once. Is there, is there uh -huh. a need of emergency baby holders? Do you want a, do you want a poopy baby? All right. Say hello to everyone on the camera. So basically, St. Paul here is giving kind of the what disposition is necessary in order not to fall away, right? So he's given the warning of what happens if you fall away and once you uh, advance in the spiritual life and learn to walk and have acquired the mind of Christ. And then he's saying, well, this is how to avoid that. These, this is how the, to, these are the pitfalls that we need to um, uh, look out for and, and seek. And so he gives Abraham as the example because Abraham is kind of the... Um, 
archetype of this, right? Where he did not see the promises of God given to him, and yet he lived in accordance to God's commands. Why? He had hope. He had hope. He had hope in those things that God would give him because, and this hope was not unfounded, right? God gave him evidence of this, which was his son, right? The birth of his son uh, from Sarah, who was well past the age of, of conception, right? So he had, so, so this hope is for us not um, unfounded. It is not irrational. It is not, um, yeah, it, it's not devoid of reason, right? We, and for us, we have that reminder. Uh, once again, this, this is, we're kind of talking about how the, the services direct our way of thinking. The church is pointing us towards something in everything we do. And what is that thing it's pointing us to? Father Gregory says this a lot. We are people of the horror. Does anybody on the on the call know if you've heard Father Gregory give any homily? We are people of the what? No. 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 <laughs> Oh, it's an R word. Resurrection. Resurrection. Okay. Every it's Sunday is a recapitulation of Pascha. Every Sunday is Pascha. Every, everything in the church. This is kind of what we were talking about with the um, with the like what Pascha does liturgically that, that differs from Nativity, right? It's from Pascha that we get our entire uh, um, lectionary. What it is we're reading on a day is in relation to Pascha. So every day when we look at what we're supposed to be reading, we're reminded of Pascha, right? We are people of the resurrection. And it is it is the Paschal feast. It is Christ's resurrection is the evidence that we place our hope on. We have hope that God will save us from death because he himself has destroyed death, right? So so St. Paul is telling us, right, that we need to be per, that we need to be patient and persevere in our struggles. And that we do this with the resurrection always in mind. Keep our eyes on Christ. We keep our eyes on the things that he's done for us. You know, if, if all we did was say, well, I need to struggle, I need to struggle, I need to struggle. Why? Well, I don't know. Something will happen someday. We had nothing to base it off of. We wouldn't make it very far. We'd give up pretty quickly. But, you know, the Christian life is a life of crucifixion. We crucify ourselves. We crucify the flesh and all of its members because... Christ was crucified, and what happened when Christ was crucified? On the third day, he rose. He rose. He rose. So we know that if we follow Christ and we partake of His crucifixion through the crucifixion of our own lives, we too will be will will rise with Him, which Saint Paul will then talk about further um, as we go. And and this is foundational to what it means to be of the order of Melchizedek, right? Which we will talk about next week. Um, and so I think we can leave it at that since it is 8.45. Um, so yeah, any, any other questions? The only question I would have would be about the scroll that they came out. Yeah, we can talk about that. That's it? All right, anyone online? Any questions? Lori said she had to go. Um, Bye, Lori, she's gone. Jackie has thumbs up. All right, everyone. Uh, next week, we will go over, um, what is it? Hebrews 7 and 8. Um, so we're basically, the schedule we're going at, we will end a week before Lent. Not the not like the Thursday before Lent, but a week before that. So um, that's what. I think in like two or three weeks, we'll be done with Hebrews. Maybe three, three weeks. Three weeks from now, we'll be done with Hebrews. So we're basically doing two chapters, but then... We'll, we'll have to do three chapters at some point. Um, so we'll have to do three chapters one week, which means I'll just have to not digress for the first 30 minutes of the Bible study. No, and we'll see. actually try and no, stay on topic. And um, yeah, so anyways, that's it. Uh, well, may God help you, everyone. See you all at St. Vladimir's. For those of you who live here, um, you are welcome to everyone who just said thank you. See you this weekend. How do I end the recording? I say maybe because I will be out of town um, for just Sunday. <laughs>